Well, we've come to the last week of our series on angels. We've been talking about angels. We've been studying angels since Christmas because the Christmas story is filled with angels, thousands of angels. But actually, angels play a key role in the whole story of the Bible. In the scriptures, from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, there are more than 300 references to angels. And what we've learned is that angels are not cute, cuddly, little cherubs with wings. They are fearsome creatures created by God to worship and serve him. The heavens are filled with these invisible beings. God has an army of angels, too many to count. And the good news is they're on our side. (laughs) They can bring us messages from God, as we've talked about in this series. They can visit us in our dreams, comfort, guard, protect, and pray for us. And even though we're not in the Christmas season anymore, sadly, there's still something more we can learn from the angels in this final episode of the series. So last week, we we were talking about how angels helped Jesus prepare for his mission to save the world. You might remember Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, and then he goes out into the desert and is tempted away from that mission, but the angels come and serve him and minister to him and strengthen him. And today we're going to take a closer look at how the gospel writer John introduces the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. It's a little different than the other gospel readings. And this beginning to Jesus' public ministry begins with a shocking miracle that has been the subject of many jokes at cocktail parties about how Jesus turns water into wine. But the story is not what it seems. See, it's not about a wedding, not really, not a wedding between two people, but something much deeper. It's about getting humanity back on track. Let me explain. See, the people of the Bible struggled to obey God's commandments, just like you and I do. God freed them from slavery. He protected them in the desert. He led them into the promised land. He defeated hordes of enemies so they could settle on that land. He sent them prophets to guide and enlighten them, but they kept failing over and over again. They worshiped other gods, they exploited the poor, and they cheated each other. And so the gospel today is really an announcement from heaven that something new is going to happen, that they don't have to worry anymore because their Savior had come and would fix everything. So I want to just look at a few things in this passage, which is extremely rich, to try to help you see what I'm um, talking about here. So it begins like this. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana, In Galilee. Now, when the wedding took place, you might say, Who cares? I wasn't invited. I don't care what day of the year it was or when it was. And what are we talking about? Three days anyway. So it might seem like a trivial piece of information, but it actually has huge significance, enormous significance. You see, John, who wrote this, is pointing back to something foundational that happened about 1,500 years earlier. After leading the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, Moses brings them to a place called Mount Sinai. You may have heard of that. It was the place where God gave the Ten Commandments to the people. And it was also the place where God offered the people to be in a special relationship with him called a covenant. He entered into a covenant with the people at Mount Sinai, and the people all agree to enter into this covenant. And they promise, they say to God, we will do everything God tells us to do. Of course, they didn't, (laughs) which is why they're in this predicament. Then God tells the Israelites he will appear to them three days later, and he makes a huge deal about it. Moses tells the people, be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And as promised, God appears and reveals his glory on the third day. And so it's not a coincidence that John, who wrote this gospel, uses that same time period, three days, to speak of this wedding where Jesus would come to reveal 
that he was renewing this covenant from 1,500 years ago where the people kept failing and failing. and He was renewing the covenant. Now, here's the other thing about this story. Jesus' mother was also at the wedding, and there was a bit of a strange interaction between them. You may have caught it in the story. She tells him that the wedding party has run out of wine. She's a good mom. She's a good mom type. So she was like really concerned for the bride and the groom. It would have been a huge disaster. It would have been very embarrassing. But Jesus seems to disrespect her, doesn't he? He says, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. Now it's an odd exchange, right? He doesn't even call his mother by her name. He doesn't call her Mary or Mama or, you know, Mommy Dearest or whatever you call mom, your mom in Aramaic back then. He calls her woman, which was an appropriate way to address a woman back then. That was okay. You could say woman to a stranger on the street, but not your mother. What Jesus was doing, therefore, was he was actually distancing, he was trying to make a point. He was distancing himself from an exclusively mother-son relationship. She becomes not only the mother of Jesus, but also the, and this is critical, the embodiment of the people of God. She becomes the representative of all the people who are going to witness this changing of water into wine, which is the renewal of this covenant from so long ago. And just as the people at Mount Sinai promised to do whatever God told them to do, listen to what Mary says. She tells the servers, do whatever he tells you to do. You see, she's the embodiment of the people. She represents the people in this covenant. And so John is trying to make that really clear that this story is related to what happened way back at Mount Sinai when God first made a covenant with his people. So then the big event happens, right? Jesus turns a huge amount of water, about 180 gallons, into perfect wine. Now, why did he do that? Well, wine was used by the ancient prophets as a symbol of God's salvation that was to come. So like for example, the prophet Joel in the Old Testament, he promises that on that day, on the day of salvation, the mountains will drip with new wine. On that day, the covenant God made with his people on Mount Sinai so long ago would be renewed and it would be like a great wedding. A great wedding banquet with gobs of wine. And this renewed or new covenant would be like an unbreakable marriage bond between God and his redeemed people. It would be like a marriage. That's why the symbol of the wedding. Just like it says in the first reading, the ancient prophet Isaiah says, as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. He will marry you, humanity. You see, far more than a random wedding, this story is an announcement that Jesus has come to renew the covenant and establish a new marriage bond between God and his faithful people, and those people are represented by Mary. It was a sign that Jesus had come to fulfill that covenant and to save us, to save us from our hurts and our hang-ups our addictions, our bad choices, our worry and our doubt, our stress and tension, our sadness and sorrow. He came to save us from all of that. But here's the thing about a marriage. Everybody who's ever been in a marriage knows this. It takes two to tango, right? Everybody has to give 100%. Each partner has to give 100% to the marriage. And so we have to live up to our end of the bargain, right? We have to act like redeemed people. And that's where the angels can keep us. That's where they can help us. The angels keep us on track spiritually. They're kind of like spiritual directors. They're great spiritual directors. The angels try to help you with your relationship with God. If you let them, if you call on them and ask them to help. And and you may say, well, how can the angels do that? Well, they're uniquely qualified for that role. And Let me just explain, it's gonna take just a second, but I want you to stick with me because there are nine types of angels mentioned in the Bible, nine times. And they are arranged into a hierarchical 
body. And each level of this angelic body is called a choir. You probably heard that, choirs of angels. There are nine choirs of angels, and each choir has a different job. The highest choir is made up of angels called the seraphim, which means the burning ones. They comprehend God with complete clarity. They're closest to God. That's all they do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is focus on God. And so their love for him burns the hottest. And then the next level down are the cherubim. Their name means fullness of wisdom. And so they contemplate God's wisdom. The thrones come next. They contemplate, it's a strange word, thrones, but it's God's throne that's being referred to. They contemplate God's power and judgments that come from his throne. Then come the dominions, which means authority, and they command the angels below them. That'd be a great job. I'd like to have that one. The virtues receive their orders from the dominions, and they run the universe kind of keeping the trains running on time, so to speak. And then below them are the powers that serve the virtues by fighting against evil influences. And then the last three choirs of angels. I hope you've been paying attention. There's a quiz after this. The last three choirs are the ones who directly intervene in human affairs, the ones we've been talking about. The principalities care for cities and governments. Then come the archangels. The next to the lowest rung, sorry, archangels, they are the ones who bring messages to human beings. And we know about three of them in the Bible, Gabriel, Raphael, and Michael. And finally come the ordinary angels or guardian angels that protect and care for each person that we've talked about in our prior episodes. Now, if these names or some of them sound familiar, they should because we hear them in the prayer that the priest says right before the holy, holy, holy. So listen for it today. But the point I'm trying to make with all of this going through the choirs of angels is that the angels are the ones who are in heaven contemplating God up close and personal. They also know human beings very well because they help us. And so for that reason, They are very much qualified to help us with our spiritual lives. And they can do that if we let them in two important ways. First of all, angels are masters of worship. They were made to worship. They live in God's presence. They stay focused on Him. In fact, they have front row seats to all the action. But you and I were also made for worship. It's our first and most important purpose in life is to worship God. And like eating or sleeping, you simply cannot live and not worship because the question is not whether you will worship, the question is what you will worship. You can tell what someone worships by looking at where they spend their time and their money. And we tend to worship what we believe will give meaning and purpose to our lives, so sometimes we worship the wrong things, don't we? But worshiping anything less than God will never bring lasting happiness. All that fame, beauty, athletic ability, power, money, all these things that we normally crave are things that are fleeting. They're not worth worshiping. Only God and his love is sustaining even when we die. Authentic worship is always directed to God and it comes with the reward of being deeply happy even when the circumstances are really bad. And angels can help us to worship by gently lifting our minds and hearts to God because they're experts at it. So if you're having trouble focusing, if this homily is too long, if if you're praying at home and you just get off track all the time, just ask the angels to help you and they will do it. Whenever we get off track in life, it usually starts with false worship, doesn't it? It was the same for the Israelites in the Bible, but that's the second way that angels can help us in our spiritual lives. Every day, you and I struggle to live a good life, don't we? We struggle to give more than we take, to build up rather than tear down, to love unconditionally like God does, to serve unselfishly like Jesus does, to honor God with our whole being. It's a struggle. It's part of the human condition. It's not easy. A friend of mine recently said that every decision in life is ultimately between love and money. Maybe she's right. 
and it's a powerful battle for control. All of us have times in our lives when we've seen people we know or love do things that are bad or that even seem evil. Even the best of us have had unspeakable thoughts. It's almost as if we have an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, including me, whispering in our ears what to do. Now that may seem a little childish, but there are bad angels, and no study of angels would be complete without a brief examination of the bad angels, otherwise known as demons. They were created by God just like the good angels. They were created good, but they fell into sin of their own free will. And here's the thing. If bad angels or demons are real, and they are, spiritual warfare between good and evil is real. And guess what? To the victor belongs the spoils, your soul and mine. God never tempts us to sin, but demons sometimes do. They tempt us with greed, lust, power, pride, every other deadly sin, gluttony, whatever is your favorite one. They also try to convince us that truth is negotiable and that being a little bad sometimes is actually good for you. That's a lie. But here's the good news. In this daily struggle to live your best life, God's army is infinitely stronger. The angels are great warriors. They have lots of experience with it. Long ago, they took out the trash, so to speak. Like a new sheriff in town, the angels cleaned up the streets of gold and kicked out the demons from heaven. And so whenever you feel weak and tempted, when you're not sure you're doing the right thing, when you so want to have that drink and you know you shouldn't, or you, walk out on your, or you want to walk out on your family, or you want to cheat at work or school, or you just want to give up trying to be good, call on the angels. They will be at your side in an instant. If you're open to it, you will know that they are there. They will come to strengthen you in the battle so that one day when the angel of death comes to carry you home, you will have nothing to fear. Well, we've come to the end of our series on angels, and next week we pick up a whole new topic. It's going to be a great topic. You're going to love it. So many of you have told me how much you have loved this series and you hate to leave it, so I've got one last thought for you. It's my favorite, not one of my favorite movies of all time, um, a little more accessible than the one I told you about last week. Uh, it's a Disney movie. I love Disney movies, as you probably know. It was made a long time ago in 1994. It's called Angels in the Outfield. It's about a young boy named Roger. That's probably why I like the movie. Roger was living in a foster home. His mom had died and his father had given him up because he didn't think he could take care of him. And Roger, in this foster home, he prays for a chance to have a real family again. And he asks his dad, who comes for a visit occasionally, when can we be a real family again? And his dad says, he kind of quips, he says, when the California Angels, the baseball team, win the pennant. Well, Roger takes him seriously and he prays that the team will win. And the team had been down on its luck for a long time, but in the very next game, Roger sees a group of angels helping the players. Nobody else sees them but him. The angels start to win games and make a surprising second half surge to the top of their division. But during the final game of the season, none of the angels show up. But the team wins anyway because they finally believe in themselves. And at the end of the movie, sorry, spoiler alert, Roger is adopted by the team manager played by Danny Glover. It's a touching moment, but Roger is sad still because he knows the angels are leaving. And as they're flying away, one of them comes back to Roger and he comforts him. And he says, we're always watching. And so even though we have to leave the angels now, please remember, they will never really leave you.